Hi, everyone. We're just going to give it a few minutes to let everyone join. Um, We'll just give it one more minute. We still have a few more people coming on. All right, so we're gonna get started. Um, good mid-morning to everyone joining us. Um, I am moderator for this um, webinar. Um, Rachel Giafrian, our APDA um, INR coordinator is um, not able to be here today. So I, I'm gonna be moderating and we wanna welcome everyone to the American Parkinson's Disease Association Fall Webinar Series. Um, it's our Parkinson's educational webinars. My name is Amanda Brill, and I'm so honored to be hosting for this webinar. Um, uh, the American Parkinson's Disease Association, or APDA, is the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease. We work tirelessly to assist the more than 1 million Americans living with Parkinson's disease to live life to the fullest. Um, APDA distinguishes itself as the national organization, working one-on-one -on -one with the Parkinson's disease community to make each day better. You can find out more information um, about all of the resources that APDA has to offer by visiting us on the website of um, apdaparkinson.org slash CT, or you can call us at 860-734-6393 um, there's so much that the APDA tries to do for our Parkinson's disease community in, in Connecticut. Hartford Healthcare was fortunate to have been chosen to host one of only 23 APDA information and referral centers uh, across the United States. We are always available to you if you're looking for any assistance or information regarding Parkinson's disease, as well as resources. Um, and we would like to also extend a special thank you to the sponsors of this year's educational series. Our help, heartfelt gratitude to our silver sponsors, Abby, Griswold Home Care, Kiora Kieran, and Neurocrin. Please visit their websites for more information on their products and services. Um, for the ground rules today, you will notice that on this Zoom platform, you have all been muted to minimize unintentional distractions to the speaker from the background noise. Um, we absolutely do want to hear from you. So if you have questions or um, thoughts on the topic and what we're sharing, please feel free to type any uh, questions and thoughts into the chat box throughout the presentation. Um, and we'll try to answer those at the end of our our presentation. Just click on the chat icon at the bottom of the banner on your screen and type in your question. Um, 
And now to introduce today's speaker is Scott Parmalee. He's a representative of Abby and longtime advocate for our Parkinson's community. Thank you very much, Amanda. It's my honor this morning to introduce Jennifer Lambert, licensed clinical social worker for Chase Family Movement Disorder Center in Mystic, Connecticut. Jennifer has been in the behavioral health field for over 20 years. She earned her BBA in accounting and BA in political science from the University of Massachusetts, then went on to obtain her Master of Social Work from Portland State University in Oregon. She has experience providing individual, family, and group therapy for patients and caregivers struggling with adjusting to a movement disorder, as well as other behavioral health conditions, such as depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use, and psychosis. She focuses on helping patients build better coping skills to be able to manage life in a healthy, productive way. She is also a registered yoga teacher. Over to you, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much. Can everyone see my slides? Can you see them? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Jennifer. And so today I'm going to be talking about sort of psychosocial strategies for managing the holidays. And I, I'm so honored to be invited here today. And I, I love the holiday season, really, from uh, September 1st, when fall starts all the way through the end of the year and New Year's. I really, I love all the holidays. I love the gatherings and get together. So I'm, I'm very excited to be talking about this, this topic today. So what is in my glass? What is in your glass? So sometimes you look at this glass and somebody say, what do you see, right? Is it half full? Is it half empty? Um, and, and my statement is no, it is a glass with 1.25 cups of water in it. So when we start kind of coming into the holidays, we want to really look at what our, our resources and our limits are when we're managing sort of a, a serious medical condition like Parkinson's, right? It's, it's having a realistic and non-judgmental assessment of, of what your, your, again, your reasons are, what you have going for you, and also, you know, what, what your limitations are. Parkinson's is, um, as you probably already know, a progressive disease. So, what, what you were able to do last year, how things worked last year, might very well be different than they are this year. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. This is the uh, scene from The Princess Bride, and I thought it was really like appropriate, right? So the, the characters in this movie, the one on the left is Wesley. He's been mostly dead all day, and they brought him back to life to rescue his true love and avenge the other man's father who was wrongfully murdered. And so as they sat there and he can barely move, he says, you know, what's our limitations? And he says, there's only one working castle gate and it's guarded by 60 men. He said, what are our assets? Your brains, physic strength and my seal. That's it, it's impossible. If I had a month to plan, maybe I could come up with something, but this. So here's the good news. It's, we have time to plan. You know, we have a couple of weeks before things come up. If you're celebrating Hanukkah, you're kind of in the middle. So your plan might not have as much time to come together. But a lot of it is looking at sort of what your bases are and then coming up with a good plan. And that sort of starts with a self-assessment. So thinking about yourself, you know, sort of honestly, what is, what is your energy level like right now? You know, it might be different day to day. It might be kind of overall waxing and waning with the seasons. For some people, the holidays, especially now as it's getting darker, is a little bit of a slower time. And that's, that's fine. It's fair. But taking a moment to think, you know, what is my energy level right now? Thinking about what's the best time of day for you? right? What's the worst time of day? Some folks, again, it's all very personal, do a lot better in the morning. Other folks find afternoon is better. And again, it's just sitting here and kind of starting to, to map out, you know, what are the times when, you, when you're at your best? Um, how long can you stand for? How long can you walk for? Um, kind of having this rough idea and really kind of thinking about it. You know, a lot of things that we do, we don't 
necessarily kind of keep in our conscious mind. You know, we, we do it, you manage it, but you might not have put any real conscious thought into thinking about sort of those scenarios. But, but taking a few minutes to kind of think about like, what are, what are my abilities right now? It, it will help with that process. Um, thinking about what, in what situations is it easy for you to communicate? You know, oftentimes with Parkinson's, your voice can get softer. Um, sometimes there are cognitive limitations, which just sort of means that there's more time to kind of get the words in and get the words out. So thinking to yourself, you know, when is it easiest for me to communicate? What, what are some scenarios that might make it harder? Um, and then thinking about the other factors that might affect you enjoying the holidays. So, you know, Parkinson's disease might not be the only medical condition or limitation that you're managing. It might not be the worst. You know, there are things like hearing impairments, vision impairments, gastric issues like IBS. Um, some folks out there might be recovering from cancer treatment, you know. So there are these other things too where, you know, might be sort of affecting sort of your overall wellness and what you can reasonably do over the, the holiday season. Um, another part of the assessment, I think, is also taking a moment to look at what is the most important thing about the holiday season for you, because it might not be feasible to do everything that you did last year or five years ago, and, and there's no right or wrong answer, you know, there's not like a good answer, um, you know, it's, it's really, you know, thinking about what makes this meaningful for you. You know, for some folks, it's just being with your family. You guys can eat pizza and watch a Christmas story and that feels good. Um, for others, what feels really special is like the meal quality itself. You know, the, the certain foods that are really kind of associated with this time of year. Um, and it can be really different depending on your cultural background, right? So, so looking at the different parts of the meal that might be the most important. Um, for some folks, you might say that there's a religious service, and really that is the, the pinnacle for you of, of celebrating the holidays. Um, for some who are really kind of like their love language is giving, you know, it's finding the perfect gift. It's, it's finding the toy that your, your, your niece is really going to like. It's something special for your partner. So for some folks, again, that might be where you really think is the, the most enjoyable part of the holidays. Um, other folks really enjoy sharing the season through volunteering, whether it's, you know, buying some toys for toys, um, toys for tots or, you know, volunteering, you know, um, at a community center or some other way. So that becomes what makes it feel for you. So taking a moment to think about, you know, and prioritize what what is the most important thing about the holidays for you so that if something has to go, you know, that that is is what stays on your schedule. All right, after, after we do an assessment, we have a plan. And it was Benjamin Franklin who says, if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So having an idea ahead of time, right? Using some, some time to think about what is the strategy that you're gonna have that's gonna help you kind of get through the holiday season with the limitations that you have. Um, and you, you kind of look at all of that and try to figure out how do you make it move forward. Um, having Parkinson's disease does not mean you have to give up your holiday celebrations. Um, I think the key is, again, somebody said <laughs> something I was reading, like you want to plan like Martha Stewart, right? So Martha Stewart, you know, doesn't just sort of walk out and put together some big, beautiful, you know, curated, you know, meal. There's a lot of work and effort that goes in. And I was, there's a story of a woman I was, I, I, I read about, you know, and she talked about hosting a Thanksgiving dinner for 22 people at her house. And she planned it months in advance. She hired someone to clean. She created a menu. She delegated the dishes to guests. A friend came over the day before the holiday to set the table. Um, relatives were assigned jobs to serve dinner and clean up afterwards. Um, and again, she had a, 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 a she had Parkinson's and she had all this stuff and she really wanted this to happen. And so she really went behind to kind of look at things. And so, and I think that that becomes part of what works out is, is having kind of that details and realizing all the elements that kind of go into what you might want to have happen. 
The other, the other piece I think that's so important in your plan is to be flexible. You know, a lot of times, you know, we really do like things to be a very certain way. And especially when we look at things like holiday routines and like traditions, which may have gone on for years and years, you know, there's a lot of comfort and enjoyment, things being exactly the way they were from year to year. And so some of having this plan is being willing to realize and be open to it not looking like how it did last year, or being willing to, as things progress, modify the plan when it, if it becomes like, you know what, this, I thought this was going to work, but it turns out it's really not going to work. So, you know, kind of reminding yourself, like, you know, you want to be flexible, like a tree, you know, trees bend in the wind, if they didn't bend in the wind, they'd break. So trying to sort of maintain that kind of flexibility. You know, uh, another thing about the plan that's important is, is good plans are detailed. So as you kind of think about this, and again, I would, I would, I'm very type A if you haven't figured out. So I love these plans. And I, I think that again, kind of even just sort of roughly sketching them out can help kind of shake a lot of information out of your head that will, will be helpful in the long run. Um, good plans are detailed. So thinking about like the what, you know, what are the things that you like to do? So we talked about sort of the most meaningful, but a lot of times there's multiple things. So is it is it going to a neighborhood party? Is it, um, you know, really, investing in just the decorations. So some folks have these incredible Christmas lights and Christmas displays in their front yards. Um, is it, you know, Christmas Eve? Is it Christmas Day? Is it Kwanzaa? Is it, are certain things that come together that are sort of what, what you do and your family does during the year? And, and a lot of times there's especially, you know, around this time of year, there's sort of multiple things that come together, especially for folks with who might be um, younger and still working. So there's office parties and things like that that all sort of go into the equation. Um, and then thinking about like the what, like is this, is this what I wanna use my resources on? So if there are multiple things that you typically do during the year, is this, is this something you wanna keep doing? So, you know, if, if there's like a, you know, you're go, you for the past 40 years gone to your brother's house for, you know, a meal on Christmas Eve, you know, that might be a tradition you really want to keep. Um, if for the past several years you've gone to your former boss's like cookie party and you really don't dig, you know, his wife, um, maybe that's something you can finally let go of, you know, and so thinking about like, you know, is this, is this really, you know, what I want to invest my resources in? Um, the, the when and for how long, so kind of coming back to that assessment of, of the resources, right? So, when is when is the event that you're going to go to you know how long does it usually run you know how long can you feasibly stay for you know sometimes you might might want to go for an hour or two whereas the party might go on until you know one o'clock in the morning uh looking at the the where you know um is is sort of the the situation so like is it is it indoors or is it outdoors you know some things might be happening where you're at an outdoor thing, there's uh, tree lighting, other things that might be really cold and it's kind of hard to regulate your temperature. And so that might be something that doesn't feel really great. Or um, is it something with uh, a few close friends? Uh, or is it a big loud party? You know, what are the different elements? Um, is it a familiar or an unfamiliar environment? So, you know, it might be again that that situation where you've gone to your brother's house for the past 40 years for for Christmas Eve dinner, or maybe your granddaughter is, you know, she's put off her her wedding because of COVID, she's getting married and she's invited the entire family to her new in-laws. Um, and there's no idea about, you know, what the house is like, what all those other situations are that's going on. You know, it might be a very unfamiliar environment. So, you know, kind of looking at what the environments are and like, is that going to work for you? Um, thinking about, you know, the food situation, um, thinking about the bathrooms, you know, so is there, is there going to be a bathroom? So bathrooms are oftentimes something to think about when you're planning is if in a big outdoor activity, there might be a porta potty, maybe you can't get your wheelchair in, or even if there's a very, very small downstairs bathroom at a house, 
you know, in the bigger bathroom that, you know, might be able to get a walker in is, is on the second floor. So thinking about just sort of the logistics of some of these things so that, again, when you can, can find that way to accommodate them, you know, it's, it's easier and you'll have more fun. And then thinking about like the how, like how can we do this to make it successful? So it's something you really want to do. There's a couple of different things and looking at sort of the different things that might now be involved for it to be really enjoyable. So for some folks, you know, that might be if it's, you know, outdoors or there's something else kind of going on, you might want to bring a walker or like a wheelchair. So, you know, if you're not so sure if you can really walk that far at that time of day, you know, maybe bringing a device to make sure that you can participate, but you have these sort of resources so that it, it works and you can enjoy it and not have to worry about being tired or going, not being able to go all the way. Um, I think sometimes too, depending on where you are, you know, in your, in your Parkinson's journey, you know, it might be something where it's worth it to bring a caregiver so that, you know, everything is taken care of, you know, if you're, if you're partnered or married, you know, everybody can kind of do what they want and there's an extra person to help with, with logistics of things. Um, and so again, uh, when you think about sort of the plan, what you value most, look for a reasonable substitute if what you did before is no longer feasible. So, you know, if it's sort of, um, again, hosting a big meal, um, you know, maybe, maybe you have it catered or you do a potluck or instead of doing like a formal meal, you have, um, you know, just desserts. Everybody does a dessert dish. So that, you know, again, trying to figure out like, how do we do this, but maybe do it in a way that sort of works with what you have. Um, another thing in your, your plan, you know, again, is the idea of like passing on the torch. So if you have always cut down that Christmas tree and brought it in, um, or, you know, you've always been the one to, you know, put up this really beautiful, you know, yard decorations, you know, maybe this is the year you, you bring your kids or your grandkids in to help, you know, it's, it's sort of, passing on the, the torch and getting them involved so it's done. And it's also really kind of helps ensure that the tradition goes on. So, so looking at some, some different strategies for, for trying to kind of keep things going, even when they, they might look different than they have pre previously. All right, setting limits. So, um, I, I love Hallmark movies. And, and so, you know, I think that they are just fun and sweet. And I, I do kind of like them. They're very soothing for me. But there's a formula for them, right? And, and there's a lot of things going on. So they have these beautiful holiday scenarios. And, and it's all like perfect and busy, right? So like, there's like a stranger who comes to town and they get to join in on like the town's cookie decorating. And there's a gingerbread house, you know, making contest. Um, there's caroling. They have a big event and they go and they light the Christmas tree. And then there's Christmas Eve. And then that's usually when the drama happens. And then the next day there's like Christmas magic and some sort of miracle that comes through to resolve it. And that is a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of different things that go on. And, you know, only in the Hallmark world can everybody do all of those things perfectly well-dressed all the time, right? So, so part of how to make this holiday season successful is really to look at the different ways to set the limits so you can really fully enjoy what you are doing. So I think the, the first scenario talks about like following the plan, right? You, you kind of sketch it out, you have like a rough idea about what you're going to do, you're going to go you know, to here for a couple hours on this day, and then the next day you're going to, you know, do this and this. Um, follow your plan. So, I, and, and here's like an example that it comes up with, you know, if you agree to bring one type of cookies to let's say a, a, an event or a cookie party, you know, don't start the first one, feel pretty good, and then start the dough for two other types of cookies, right? So a lot of times when we look at things, you know, you'll start doing something and you'll feel really good and it doesn't bother you. And so the tendency is, and this, this is a lot that happens, when I feel good, I overdo it. So, you know, you feel good and then you kind of keep going past the point and then now you're sort of overtired. And oftentimes, you know, you, you don't feel so great the next day because you overdid it the first day. So, 
So again, sort of knowing where things are, figuring out, you know, what you reasonably could do, trying to stick to it, you know, because that's, that's how you're going to feel really great and enjoy kind of like the consistently enjoy the holiday season instead of having like highs and lows and highs and lows. Um, really think about this as a marathon, not a sprint, right? So you want to feel good throughout the holiday season. Um, you know, I, I often say like, you want to, you want to pace yourself to the new pace, right? So when we're younger, we can do a lot more, we can do it a lot faster. Um, but as things change, you know, as you age, as your Parkinson's progresses, right? So you kind of figure out what, what's a doable pace and you want to kind of keep pace with that. Avoid putting pressure on yourself, right? You know, feeling like you should do this, like, um, you know, or trying to push through again, you know, you start feeling tired. You have the plan maybe, you know, to a degree, I'm gonna say you can get off the plan, right? And it's just, it's too much, right? So if you really need to take a break and step out, you know, give yourself permission to do that. Um, and again, you know, it's it's true for all things, whether it's, it's, it's making cookies or doing your shopping, you know, just really, again, trying to figure out what is, what is doable so you can go home and do these other things and, and feel well and feel well, because that's the, the ultimate goal is to enjoy the holiday. Saying no is planning for success instead of defeat, right? So again, it's this idea of, of being able to say no. And for some people, saying no is, is hard. You don't like saying no, and you're, you've been able to get by with not saying no a lot, you know, even when it's been hard, right? So staying up all night, you know, wrapping presents or, you know, taking on a lot of different projects. Um, but it is important to be able to say no. And I think also, you know, if you're not somebody who is good at saying no, right, that's, it's how it is sometimes, you know, practice it, literally work out a script in your head, you know, so if, if you know that your kids are always expecting you to host a very big Christmas day thing at their house with the grandkids and all the noise, and you know that, you know, with your Parkinson's, that's really going to be maybe too much. It's going to be overwhelming to have that many people, that much noise, that much activity, um, you know, practice sort of working out the script of what you're going to say, saying, you know, we're not going to do dinner or we're going to do it this way. Or, you know, we're going to, how about we try it at your house this year? And then you have the ability to come and then leave when it, when you need to. So, so working out kind of the language, right? So kind of practicing it out. For some people saying no is easy. Um, in fact, they say no more than they probably should, right? So you want to set limits, don't build walls. And I think, again, there's a, a fine point that comes with, with managing a chronic health issue like Parkinson's, right? So you want to you wanna keep going, right? The more you do, um, the better you feel, right? So when you enjoy the holidays, that's a big, a big boost to your mood. It really is, is motivating and invigorating. Um, so you want to be able to say yes, and you want to be able to say no. And there's kind of like the wisdom in knowing what should I say yes to and what should I say no to. And so I think that it's, it's knowing in when, you, when you might need to say yes. And I think sometimes there's other factors that, that become involved with people. So again, there's you know, maybe fear or shame that comes up. You don't necessarily wanna go and have everybody see how you're walking now or you know, see your tremor or the other, the other limitations. Um, for some folks, there's apathy, right? Like all of a sudden, you, you just don't want to go to your daughter's house for Thanksgiving, or you, there are certain things that just kind of you're, you're indifferent about, right? And in those situations, really knowing that saying yes might be the best thing for you. And so again, kind of having that wisdom to know what to say no to, but also if, if there's things to say yes to. And again, setting limits can look like different things. You know, everybody out there who's watching this, your situation is unique. Um, and so, you know, you really have to do take stock of, of what makes the most sense for you. So setting limits, you know, to certain events, you know, maybe, maybe for folks who are, are really, you know, pretty active, perhaps there are things that you've run. You know, maybe you ran a Christmas craft show before or you, you know, help do all of these things, you know, at the senior center. Um, 
maybe maybe you can still participate, but maybe running it and having that much responsibility and handling all of the things that have gone into it, maybe it's time to again step back and still participate, but might, maybe not be like the one who's like in charge. Um, limits on like how much you're participating. Again, you know, if if your family tends to have sort of a big you know Christmas Eve thing where you know everybody's there from six o'clock to to one or two in the morning you know, maybe knowing when you need to step out and not being there for the entire time. Um, you know, another thing that I think a limit comes up is, is sort of the other things, the small things. And the example that came into my head is, you know, grandparents, you are, you are so great to your children and, and you know, babysitting and watching your, um, your grandchildren for those who it's applicable for, you know, and I think especially around the holidays, there might be a push for you to babysit a little bit more than usual, right? So, you know, you've got people calling up and being like, oh, can you watch the kids so I can go do this? Or can you watch the kids so I can go do that? Um, and you might need to look at that. And it's not that you don't love your grandkids. Um, and it, this will not make you a bad grandparent, but maybe it's sitting and saying, you know, being able to say, you know, no, I really, I need to do this. And I, I just can't have them around, um, you know, on this particular day. So I think that there are certain things too, where, where you have to reasonably look at the situation and say, you know, we, we are gonna do our, our shopping in the morning. We need to take a nap in the afternoon. And, and again, that doesn't reflect that you don't love your grandkids, but it's knowing how to set the limits. Because again, the, I think the, the big, the events of the holiday season, like parties and meals, you know, they're small. It's all the other stuff I think that really kind of builds up and, and it, it also is stuff that you have to take into account as part of that plan. It's, it's like the scenario I talked about with having the meal, right? It's not just sort of cooking and serving a meal, it's cleaning the house, it's buying the groceries, it's you know, preparing the food, it's decorating, you know, it's, it's cooking the meal, it's serving the meal, it's cleaning up after the meal, right? So all of those things together, you know, really do spread out. And there are a lot of different steps and pieces involved um, into anything. So, so adding these other small things, you know, really, really kind of add up very quickly. So that is, that is my talk about sort of the limits. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some other things that are really important to do during the holidays. And one of the things that is going to be so essential for you doing well and managing your Parkinson's during the holiday season is to maintain your wellness routine. Um, so some of the things that that go on with that right so exercising daily right exercise keeps you moving and you really don't want to drop the ball for the month of december um it is it is good to keep you physically active to maintain your ability um it's also really nice stress relief so if you're having things come up and sort of trying to figure out how to do all the things that you need to do you know exercise is just a great way to manage your stress and improve your mood. Eat well. So this doesn't mean you can't eat some, some special treats, but I think overall, really paying attention to what you eat and eating a healthy diet um, is essential for feeling well, both mentally and physically during the holiday season. This is gonna help with your energy level. It's gonna help with your mood. And it's also going to minimize constipation issues. Um, as you go through your schedule too, and part of your plan, really thinking about also, you know, meals. Um, sometimes, again, with with big holidays, things are, um, you know, spread apart, and it can be really easy to to have a huge gap between the times that you eat. Or really, if your digestion is such where really you only eat small meals, you know, missing a meal or having a meal spread out can really can really cause some disruption. So you might want to plan if you know that, um, you know, <laughs> cousin Mary always says, you know, dinner is going to be at two o'clock, but you don't actually have any food until five. You might really want to have a snack beforehand or bring a snack with you. So figuring out how to make sure that you plan to eat well and have sort of food on hand with you. Um, taking your medications at the right times, you know, Parkinson's is really one of those diseases 
where you, you the key is to take your medication exactly when you're supposed to take the medication um, because that ensures that your symptoms are as stable as they can be and minimizes the off times. You know, you you forget your medication and, and maybe maybe your family doesn't even know if you're early in your diagnosis about your Parkinson's. But if you miss your medication, your tremor might come out and then and then it might kind of, you know, out you in the situation. So again, I think that overall, you know, making sure again that you plan to, to take your medication, you know, with you so that you can take it exactly when you need to. Um, sleep. So prioritizing sleep, um, including naps, is is key. And and again, you know, it's it's not fun to to leave a party early. Um, but really making sure that you maintain your sleep schedule is going to help you enjoy the holiday. Again, it helps ensure that you don't have these like big highs of joy and then the next day you crash because you didn't get enough sleep. Um, and, and so that is definitely part of it. And then adding naps. So, you know, if you are, you know, going out to Target to buy your wife a present, you know, and, and having to go and stand in line, um, coming back and taking a nap really makes a lot of sense. So, so again, you know, making sure that you are, are doing these things and really prioritizing getting enough rest through the holidays. It's, it's a busier time, so you do need more rest. Um, and then sort of minimizing and avoiding alcohol. You know, oftentimes there's a lot of alcoholic beverages that come out and, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, you know, but a lot of times it will negatively impact your medications. It increases fall risk and, and again, you really don't want to have a fall during the holidays. Um, this is an acronym from from twelve step programs like AA and NA, and it's just I think it's just genius, right? So they talk about halt. And I would say like holiday halt, right? So what you want to do is it stands for um, H stands for hungry, A stands for angry, L stands for lonely, and T stands for tired. So you don't want to get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. So, you know, it's just, this is just kind of like a nice way to, as you go through the holidays, you know, in this next month or so, you know, take every day, just sit there and halt and think, am I hungry? Am I feeling angry about something? Am I feeling lonely or am I feeling tired, right? And using that moment to figure out, so how do I get my needs met? You know, if you're hungry, get a snack. If you're angry, like, how do you express what's going on in a way that's helpful? You know, if you're lonely, reach out to somebody. If you're tired, take a nap. Um, but this is again a nice little kind of just like a cheat to think about. You know, how do I how do I maintain my wellness during the holiday season? So my final statement is: there is no vacation from your wellness routine. So again, during the holidays, really trying to make sure that you you incorporate all of those elements in so that you really are able to enjoy them as much as possible. Um, again, your exercise, your um, diet, all these other things. Um, and then adding self-care. So, you know, we, we really do want to take care of yourself a little more because oftentimes the holidays are more stressful. Um, and so if you don't know what self-care is, right, it's, it's basically doing the things that help you recharge your mental and physical batteries. Um, now, the holidays are taxing. They're taxing physically. You're standing. You might be walking more. There's more activity than usual. And that can really make you feel tired. They're mentally taxing, right? So, you know, for some folks with Parkinson's, there are certain, like, cognitive changes that have happened, right? So trying to process all the conversations and things and events is mentally exhausting. Your brain has to work harder. That is another reason to take a nap, right? Because the nap is when your brain kind of resets itself and kind of fills its battery back up, right? So holidays can be very mentally taxing for folks who live with Parkinson's. Um, it's emotionally taxing. You know, a lot of times the holidays, you know, it's very hard. People who've lost family members over the year or, you know, even years ago, right? It's, it's a hard season for some. So there can be some, some emotional pulls and some, some struggles with going through a holiday season. Um, that's totally normal. Um, a lot of times too, uh, holidays are a time when estrangement is really visible, you know? So if you are disconnected from a family member, whether it's a sibling or a child, you know, not having them there can be something that you really feel during the holidays. So 
So doing, again, things that are very recharging is, is, is good during this season because it, it is taxing. Um, and in a season of giving, this is when you can be selfish and it's completely okay. You know, some of the things, you know, self-care is, is really personal. Um, you can practice gratitude. Um, that basically, you know, looks like every, every day before you go to bed, write down three things you're grateful for, right? So not focusing on what you can't do, not focusing on the losses, you know, thinking about, wow, it was really great to, to see my mother. Um, I really am so glad about this thing, you know, so reminding yourself of what works, right? Um, and then doing things ultimately you enjoy, whether it's reading, a hobby, meditation, you know, what, what helps you feel recharged? And again, that's personal. So what would, what would work for me may or may not work for you. So kind of taking some time to, to yourself. So Communication is sort of the last topic we're going to talk about. Um, there's a lot of, again, you know, when you come to anything that involves multiple people, communication is, is a key focus. And so communicating, I think, is something that's really helpful, especially if you know that things are going to be different this year than how they were last year. So one of the keys is ask what you need in advance. Um, you know, if if there's something where, again, you know, you're not going to host something, you know, let people know before the week before, um, you know, it just, again, helps people sort of mentally and emotionally prepare for things being different. Be specific, right? So here's, here's an example of what to do, right? So like, I have been struggling with fatigue lately and will be only able to spend an hour at your house, okay? That's kind of a nice way, right? So it's specific. It says, why you can only stay why the, an hour at their house. And the, the no is like, don't just sort of turn to somebody and be like, I can only stay an hour this year, right? Um, so it's easier for people to understand, you know, if, if they know the specifics about why, why things are different. Um, and that involves being vulnerable, right? That's admitting that you're having some issues, that you're, you're not, you know, you're not this as strong, you know, as, as you used to be. And I think that this is a hard thing to do for, for everybody. I don't know anybody who's, it's easy to be vulnerable. Um, and be brave, right? So also making a request is, is a braveness, right? So if like my example I came up with, like if you're in a choir and cannot stand to sing the whole Christmas Eve service, ask for a chair, even if you're the only person sitting, right? So. So I think that, you know, that allows you to, to participate in something that's important. And really the truth is, you know, you make this request, you might look different, but really nobody's gonna care. Um, and I think a lot of that is just sort of having the assumption that people are reasonable and kind. You know, people are more than happy to, to help you be successful and enjoy the holidays. Um, you know, ask yourself, like a lot of times, you know, people are so hard on themselves, and they would never be that way to anyone else. If it was a friend or a child who said the same thing, they'd be like, oh, sure. Um, but they don't give that kindness to themselves. Um, they say to themselves, like, I should be able to stand up, I can make it, you know, or I shouldn't do it at all. Um, but again, thinking like, if someone said this to me, how would I respond? Um, and the other thing about the holidays too is also know who's, again, most people are reasonable, know who's not reasonable. You know, there's sometimes people and there's a lot of drama that comes with them. And, and if, if you have somebody in your family who's like, no mom, I, I no dad, you have to do this. You always do this. I need you to do this, right? Um, you know, hold your boundaries. You know, you have to do what's right. And a lot of times you'll find that those people are, are you know, going to be unhappy either way. So knowing knowing who's reasonable, who's not. And again, um, you, have, you have my permission to say no and hold the line, even when it's hard. Other communication issues are, right? Like, are you out to your family or the people that you're gonna see during this holiday season about your Parkinson's disease, right? So that's, that, that plays into like effect about how things work. Um, and and <laughs> my, my, my personal service announcement is like probably, you know, a big family meal is not the time to come out um, and say, hey, everybody have Parkinson's. Um, I, I think that, but knowing sort of, you know, where you are and telling folks. Um, and if you're coming to a point, maybe you're earlier in your Parkinson's journey, like what are the pros and cons of telling people beforehand? You know, 
who do I want to tell? You know, what would be the, the, the benefit of telling them and what would be the disadvantage of telling them right now? And just kind of maybe working that out for yourself. Um, there's really, again, sort of in telling people that you have Parkinson's, there's stages, right? Like, you know, a lot of times people start with like the people who are in their in most intimate circle and then they kind of move outward and tell further family members, acquaintances, you know, work. Again, it's kind of knowing that there are different, different people you tell at different times. And also, you know, how much, right? So, you know, your cousin who you've never seen, you know, you can probably at some point say, you know, I have Parkinson's, but maybe they're just, again, if you're not intimate, you don't have to tell them all of the stuff that they, they might be sort of curious about, right? So you control how much information about your disease that you reveal, and that's, that's perfectly normal. Um, and again, you get to say who and you get to say how much. Um, kids, right? So a lot of times at holidays, you might be exposed to family members who are younger. And so, you know, having, you know, a developmentally appropriate explanation, you know, if COVID has gone on, so there might be some younger family members you haven't seen except from a Zoom screen, right? Um, so you might look different to them than you did two years ago. And so you can say something again, like I have a disease called Parkinson's. Part of my brain isn't working right. So it makes my, my handshake, or you can say it makes me walk slow or makes my voice soft. I take medication, which helps. Um, and actually APDA has this lovely little pamphlet. My mommy has PD, but it's okay. And I think it's a really nice way to kind of give kids some information about, about what Parkinson's is, you know, whether you're a, a parent, a grandparent, or another sort of relative. If there are communication issues related to Parkinson's, let them know. It might take you a minute to respond, but you will. Um, give them permission to ask questions. Um, that allows them the ability to ask anything. Again, kids can think of some wonky things and they can worry. So just let them ask questions um, and again, answer as appropriate. And then another thing you can do with, with kids, you know, I guess this is not technically communication, is enlist them to help. So kids love help. They love feeling important. So, you know, if you do have some limitations, you might ask them to get you your drink so you don't have to get up an extra time. Um, and again, just in regard to communication, sometimes it's less stressful to disclose your diagnosis than to keep it a secret. So a lot of people will find that, you know, we worry about it, we're stressed about it, um, but oftentimes that interim period before telling folks is, is more stressful than once they, they finally know. And so that is, that is it for my part of the presentation. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or Amanda or whoever else would like to answer them. Yeah, so I just wanted to say if people have questions or uh, want to share a thought that they had or an experience, um, a strategy, you can type into the chat box. It's um, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, it says chat. If you click the, on that, it should open um, a chat area. And then there is also a Q&A. Um, and so you can also type in a question. We didn't have any questions or you know, thoughts that came through as of right now, um, I think that one of the thoughts I had as you were presenting was that sometimes um, excitement or an event that is going to bring uh, more of an intense emotion can activate people's tremors and motor symptoms. And so thinking about um, strategies, um, to kind of do meditation or some breathing exercises before you walk in to a family gathering where you're excited to see people. So you can kind of calm your nerves and calm down your body. Um, and the other thing I was thinking is that a lot of times people find that if they hold something in their hands, like a water bottle or I, you know, their pocketbook, um, a gift, they sometimes, um, it helps to stabilize any tremors that they may have that might be noticeable when they're first walking into um, kind of an exciting or, uh, you know, a gathering where there's 
intense emotion associated. Um, so those are just some of the thoughts that I had had while you were speaking. I don't see any questions um, that came through. So, I mean, I think, please, anybody who sh has a thought or a question, um, I see a question. Um, how do you handle the emotional, you can't do something? So that if is a good people, question. Like if family members or people that love you tell you you can't do something, I, at least that's my interpretation. Is that what you interpreted, Jen? I, I thought like sort of maybe psyching yourself out. So. So is oh. it like telling yourself that you can't do something? Ah. Um, so, so I think that, you know, emotions are, you know, emotions are good. They're oftentimes sort of like our, our warning symptoms, right? Like they try to give us information about our environment, but sometimes again, they get, they get too much. And I think anxiety or fear about, you know, issues that come up and not doing something can kind of box us in a little bit, right? And so, you know, I think the initial response I have is to remind yourself, like, this is an emotion, it's not necessarily true. Mm. And, and sort of doing like a, like a, like a fact, like evidence wise, right? So like, write it down. I'm a real writing down person, but you could draw it, right? Like, think about like, can I do this? You know, what's the worst thing that can happen if I try it and it doesn't work out, right? And, and a lot of times when you come to that point where you're like, well, what's the, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, I, somebody doesn't, un, you know, I think about like a verbal thing, right? Like you, you're not able to speak loud enough and people keep saying, what did you say? Um, it's okay, you know? And, and so I think a lot of times the worst case scenario is not as bad as, as we sort of make it out in our head when our, when our fear is speaking. So I think that you know, kind of logically telling yourself, you know, can I feasibly do this? Um, and if the answer is yes, then, you know, giving it a try and, and having some of the, the coping skills that, you know, like Amanda said, you know, practice your breathing to keep your anxiety down, you know, maybe enlisting a support person to kind of cheer you on, like through it. Was that helpful? Amanda, did you have other ideas? No, I mean, my only thoughts were um, that you can't is a thought. It's something that is, a, is occurring in your head. It's a thought process and an emotion is a feeling. So that kind of makes me think a lot about CBT and that like your thoughts are contributing to an emotional aspect of how you feel. Um, and so, I think that you need to challenge those thoughts of you can't by thinking about all the times you've probably surprised yourself. You know, we're often a lot more capable and um, than we think we are. And so I think I, so yeah, I agree with you, Jen, that um, thinking about the things that you have accomplished and done well at and try to challenge that belief and, and I think too, so, you know, the, the next response is, you know, when you feel like a failure to yourself, you know, and, and that's when I would say, you know, it's not a failure to try. It's not a failure to try. I think a big part of, you know, um, living with Parkinson's is thinking about what can I do? What am I, you know, what do, do I do well? What can I do well? Versus what can't I do? Or what I, what I, you know, the things that you can't or don't think you can do. Trying to flip that in your frame of thinking. Um, which, you know, again, changing our thoughts and our feelings are not easy, but we are the only person that can do it. We're the only person that can change those things. And I think that unless there, I, there's no other questions, thank you uh, uh, for asking.
and sharing and being vulnerable. Um, and so oh, there's one more. Can you talk about strategies for having to give up driving? That's driving is a, you know, that is um, a really big challenge. And um, I, I don't know if Jen, you wanna address any thoughts or ideas? Strategies for having to give up driving. Um, strategies for once you can't drive anymore or strategies so when your loved one can't. So I think, you know, a lot of times when, if you're the person, you know, who has been told that you no longer can drive, you know, that is, that's a, that's a huge loss. Like that's something you grieve, you know, it's, it's, you know, adulthood is really kind of freedom when you're, you know, you're 16, you get your license and you start having much more independence, you know, and then, you know, sometimes for some people because of either the physical or the cognitive changes related to Parkinson's or, you know, other, other disorders, um, you know, the time comes when that's, that's not really feasible. And there's, there's certainly a difficult feeling. And I think sort of grieving about it is, is, normal and important it is a big thing and and then some of it is you know depending on where you are trying to figure out you know different resources for going places um because it is important to keep going out and being independent so you know it is figuring out you know is there a van with a community service center the community center that can take you where you need to go finding different ways to get to enjoyable activities different ways to get your grocery shopping done you know during the holiday season, you know, asking somebody to come get you. People, you know, uh, my nieces and love, nephews love coming to get grandma and grandpa. So like that, that makes them feel really good and kind of making sure that, you know, people are involved in, in handling that. I think that, you know, when it comes to trying to convince your loved one they can no longer drive, a lot of times working with their medical team is a really good way to start because it, it can, you know, affect the the kind of the the push pull right you know you're my child don't tell me i can't drive a car you know i think sometimes the family dynamics make it harder um than it, it needs to be so so you know as much as you can having a conversation with the neurologist or the social worker you know i think the medical the medical staff has a lot of authority behind them and people are just i think a little bit more likely to take it serious um when it when it comes from them that's that's my my initial kind of thoughts about that. Yeah, no, I I had very similar thoughts. Yeah. Well, I think that concludes our webinar for today, and um, we really do wish everyone joining us today a happy, um, enjoyable holiday season. Um, and thank you, Jennifer, for being here with us today and. Um, the work that you do is invaluable, um, and we're, we're, we're very appreciative of your time. Thank all you right. all so much. Have a happy, wonderful holiday season. Yes. Bye-bye.